Welcome in to a special edition of the Southeastern 14 podcast. I'm your host, Chris Lee. He is Blake Lovell. Blake, we don't usually podcast on a Sunday afternoon, but this is a Sunday afternoon with some big news for SEC programs. The MLB draft deadline has come and gone. You have some names of players returning to campus. I think that we didn't expect a month ago. You have some players who we don't know what they're going to do next. You have some programs in the league who got kids through the draft that you might not have expected. But let's start with the stunner. There's one first-round pick who did not sign, and it's the kid who has been the face of college baseball for three years, Kumar Rocker in the Mets, in just an alarming, stunning move, did not get together on a contract. Kumar Rocker was originally scheduled to get $6 million from the Mets after being picked 10th overall. That was above slot. There was a disagreement over the medicals. Kumar Rocker, we don't know where he's headed, but we know he's not headed to the Mets next year. And, and frankly, this is this is truly shocking. Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, we spent the entire baseball season, you and, you and Barry and you know, all of us, like we were just talking. That's all we talked about was, you know, it was going to be interesting to see where this guy lands in the MLB draft and you assume, you know, you start to look ahead the next season and try to figure out, okay, is he going to be a good spot where he can have success right away? And um, obviously given the talent and everything we've discussed, uh, you just expected it to be, you know, he, he'd go high just like he did. Um, and he'd step right in and, and be someone that's, you know, starting for a franchise next season. And now, you know, it's just um, to, to think like we, I don't think we really ever considered this scenario. Um, certainly I don't know how you could have predicted it, uh, but here we are, and uh, now it seems like, you know, you have a lot more questions and answers about how this whole situation played out. Um, I know, you know, Jeff Passan at ESPN put out a lot of stuff just based on how, you know, all of this kind of went, and um, it's certainly an interesting uh, scenario based on, you know, some of the reports on how this whole thing played out. Yeah, as someone pointed out on Twitter, the Mets will pay Bobby Bonilla more next year than they'll pay Kumar Rocker. <laughs> nice gig if you can get it, so. well. Jeff Passan, I'm just going to read you his tweet that he sent out literally two minutes after the 4 p.m. Central deadline passed. It says, the New York Mets and Kumar Rocker, their first round pick, did not come to an agreement on a deal. The Mets will get the 11th pick in the 2022 draft as compensation. Rocker will forego returning to Vanderbilt and begin his pro career. He is now draft eligible for 2022. Now, here's my question. What does a pro career look like? Because you've only got so many options. You can't sign in free agency with another team, right? I mean, there's, I guess, Japan, Korea, Mexico. I don't know what a pro career looks like. And that's my question is what does Kumar Rocker do for the next year? Because maybe I'm overthinking this, but like, if you don't go and throw next year, it does not, not lend some credence to the fact that you're, you're damaged goods, which I'm not saying he is, but that was the Mets stance without trying to put words in their mouth. But point is, I don't know where Kumar Rocker can go next year. I mean, now with name, image, and likeness, you can go and pitch professionally. I'm just wondering what that next year looks like for him. What's the plan? And I've been reaching out uh, to some people throughout the day who have some very direct connections to that situation. And I'm still sitting here waiting for an answer as we do this podcast about 35 minutes after the signing deadline. Yeah, I mean, it's like we said, I still think the, you know, the big theme here is is how does this continue to play out? Like we know how it played out coming to, you know, not being able to have a deal in place and all this other stuff. But what's next for him? Like you said, it's I mean, it's one thing to say that, you know, you're going to continue to sort of just prepare for your professional career. But like you mentioned, it's um, what does that look like? And, and is that going to be a scenario like we said, if we're talking a month ago, like we're not, I don't even know what that scenario is even in the back of your mind. If you're Kumar Rocker and you're thinking about, you know, what's, what's next? Because I, I think again, all of this you, you assume is leading to that point to where you sign and you go straight into, you know, major leagues and, and you're ready to go. But now, like you said, I don't know what, I don't know what it does for him again, not knowing sort of the logistics of what this is going to look like for him. Um, again, assuming that this is the approach they go with, uh, this is what they're going to do. Um, but I don't know what that looks like. And I think until we figure out what it looks like, 
it's really hard to know, you know, what kind of place is this going to be for him uh, getting ready to, you know, go into the 2022 draft. Um, what, well, again, what does that look like if you're looking from the outside looking in and let's say you're a team next season who's in that spot to potentially draft him, you know, in a high spot or wherever it's at at that point. Um, I don't know, like, what does this upcoming year sort of look like for him, uh, knowing how this entire thing played out here in, in this 2021 draft? Well, and see, that's the thing. I wonder how much anybody really knows because yeah. nobody was prepared for this. Like I, I talked to somebody w- without name and names who would, would absolutely know what the situation was there this morning. And I, I was told basically it's, it's noise, posturing, whatever word you want to use. And, and here we are hours later and Kamar Rocker is not a Met. So that brings us back to the health issue. Another thing that had surfaced, and I don't remember who tweeted this out, but someone had claimed that there were well-known health issues around him uh, that the people of Vanderbilt need. That, that's not true. Um, and I've spent a lot of my morning and afternoon digging to find out what is the thing that set this whole thing off. And either it is an incredibly closely guarded secret. I mean, I know of, of a couple things that that were sort of issues and that, that's probably even a strong word for it. I don't know how to how to put this without disclosing what I know, which I, which I got in confidence, but here's the point I'm making, right? The the closest thing to a smoking gun that I've been able to come up with um is more of a super soaker as far as guns go, for for lack of a better way to put it. So, if there is a big issue it is a very well guarded secret. I don't know if this was just ego of parties getting in the way. You've you've got the Cohen ownership group of the Mets. He's got a rep for tough negotiations. Scott Boris, like if you know baseball and know that name, you know what Scott Boris is like. And I have no issues with Scott Boris. He's doing the best for his clients. So I don't know if it just got to be um, you know, a, a big Mac match of chicken and egos wouldn't allow it to <laughs> to escalate into a contract for, for back, lack of a better way to put it. But I'm still sitting here as we do this. Um, I haven't reached out to some people this morning and, and talked to people who have given me some really good things on that program. And we're still a little bit in the dark. Let me read you the statement that Jeff Passon tweeted out. that comes from Scott Boris rockers agent. Kumar rocker is healthy. According to independent medical review, by multiple prominent baseball orthopedic surgeons. Immediately upon conclusion of his collegiate season, he had an MRI on both his shoulder and his elbow. When compared with his 2018 MRIs, the medical experts found no significant change. Kumar requires no medical attention and will continue to pitch in the regular course as he prepares to begin his professional career. So right there, uh, that seems to rule out sitting out. Uh, He will continue to pitch, according to his agent. Again, the, the question is where, and to me, it's hard to conceive of a landing spot for him. I mean, frankly, it seems that Vanderbilt would be the less, best landing spot for him now with name, image, and likeness, and, and that's complete speculation. That's not me saying he's coming back to Vanderbilt, but I'm trying to figure out where he would go. I mean, are you going to go to Japan and sign a multi-year contract over there and have the language barrier? I just don't, for the life of me, it's hard to conceive where he can play baseball in an ideal situation next year. Yeah, I mean, unless, like you said, unless it's Vanderbilt, like I don't know what the the next closest ideal scenario would be in that scenario. Um, because I don't, I, I don't necessarily look at it and feel like that that's overseas or, or doing something like that. And like you said, I mean, if you, if you don't pitch at all, um, that's I think that's even more concerning, probably from the outside looking in, is you know that probably reads a different way than perhaps you want it to read if that's how you go about it. So it's, it's going to be interesting because um, I mean, one of the things, and you mentioned it is when you get into these kind of things, certainly in professional sports, and we're talking about contract negotiations and, and all these other things, there can be a lot of smoke screens. There can be a lot of things at play as we know. And you said one and specifically with ego um, and, and all these other things. Um, and I don't think the Mets have probably done themselves any favors over the years when it comes to, uh, like you kind of joked about, uh, Bobby Bonilla is still getting paid from the Mets. Uh, I know it's a completely different situation, but it's like this is a franchise that 
doesn't probably necessarily have a, a ton of goodwill uh, over the years with, with some of this stuff anyway. So I can only sort of imagine how their fans are looking at this uh, from that standpoint. But from a Kumar Rocker standpoint, it's just, you know, it is, it's wild to think that this is the situation that has played out. Again, thinking going into the season, this guy was perhaps, you know, him and Jack Leiter, we said it. I mean, two of the best pitchers in the entire country, uh, just based on what they could do once, not only in college, but what they could also do once they got to the professional level. And to now be sitting here thinking that, yeah, one of them is, is signed, sealed, delivered, ready to go for the, the Texas Rangers, and the other one, a top 10 pick. Um, we have no idea what's kind of next for him. Yeah, this is just still hard to get your head around. I, I just where this goes next from here, I guess we'll wait and see. Let's move on. I guess the next biggest story involving a returning player, Judd Fabian, heading back to the Gators rather than signing with Boston. Now, Fabian is young for his class, so he's got a little bit more leverage. I, I think Fabian was wanting more along the lines of, of maybe $3 million was the figure I heard today rather than the I think the 1.5 or whatever slot would have been at that number for him. But Judd Fabian, Florida center fielder, a guy who was projected as a potential top five overall pick heading into the season, returning to Florida. Boy, that is massive news for Kevin O'Sullivan and the Gators. Well, and for a Gators team, as we know, that's uh, you would think probably going to have a bit of a, a chip on its shoulder based on how this past season played out, starting as the uh, preseason number one. And, and we know how things ended there. Uh, for them specifically in that that final game, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, and I, you you brought up something earlier that I I didn't necessarily say when we were talking about Rocker, but I think it's very interesting to think about sort of maybe how this goes moving forward. As we said, there's not a lot of players that necessarily you know are huge surprises based on the decisions they made this year, but this whole name, image, and likeness thing, and the fact is, you know, you can still come back to college now and hey, you're going to have opportunities to make money. And perhaps for some, you know, like you said, if there's if there's such a big discrepancy in what you think you should be getting based on your contract, you know, in the MLB and the draft and where you're slotted and all that versus, hey, I could come back and, and make pretty consistent money, um, you know, pick up some sponsors here or there, do, do a lot of different things. There's just a lot more options now. And I think that's going to be kind of interesting to see moving forward. Again, I don't think that's necessarily anything in the short term that you're all of a sudden just going to see 20 or 30 kids come back and say, oh, OK, well, we're just going to we're not going to pursue the professional yet. We're going to come back and do this uh, just based on NIL. But I do think that you're going to see, you know, that that sort of trickle down effect to where guys certainly have more options now than they would have before, knowing that this is a possibility. Um, we're already we've talked about it, you know, with football and all these other things, the numbers that are being thrown around with what kids are already earning. Um, and yeah, so I think, you know, if you're someone that, that feels like that you're not necessarily getting what you think you're worth, uh, in these negotiations with, with these MLB teams, uh, come back, have another season and, um, you know, pursue other options there. All right, let's run through a few other returning players in the Southeastern conference. Julian Bosnick, the South Carolina left-hander who is really good arm for them. Very talented, could potentially be a Friday night guy for them next year. He was drafted in round 16 by the Giants, did not sign. Seth Halverson, a righty out of Missouri, who I think might have been their number one at points this year, he not only didn't sign, he's transferring to Tennessee. Dominic Keegan, who had a tremendous year, although more of the damage done out of conference rather than in it, which is why he went as late as he did. He was drafted 19th by the Yankees. Dominic Keegan returning to Vanderbilt next year, which he announced long ago. Could end up being the Commodores catcher with C.J. Rodriguez signing with the A's. He did catch in high school. And Elijah Trest, left-hander from Arkansas, also returning. He was taken, I want to say, in the 19th round. Yes, that was by the Rockies. So I think that is the comprehensive list of players from the league who were already in the league who were drafted and did not return or chose, excuse me, chose to return. So what you're saying is that the SEC is still probably not going to lack talent next season in baseball. Uh, there's probably somebody... I have a feeling, no. <laughs> there's going to be, in addition to all the new players coming in and all the returners um, that we were already kind of slotted in to be back, 
Um, now you get some guys back who, you know, proved that, that they do have uh, aspirations and, and their opportunity at the professional level. So, yeah, all those are interesting. I think, like you mentioned, I think, you know, Dominic Keegan at Vanderbilt is one that certainly, um, you know, I think about you look ahead to, to next season and kind of what his role could be on that team and maybe how it's different than this season and, and those types of things. But yeah, I mean, I think if you're, like we mentioned, if you're an SEC team and you get some of these guys back, um, you'll take it just based on, you know, again, knowing that a lot of these programs around the league are already going to be in good shape to be, you know, top 25-esque type teams. You know, several of them will be top 10 type teams. Um, so to add guys like that back into the mix uh, certainly helps you. Okay, let's run down the list of SEC commitments who were drafted and did not sign this is a list I have. Davis Diaz, shortstop slash catcher commitment to Vanderbilt. He was drafted in round 12. That's not indicative of the talent he was. He was a consensus, almost consensus top 100 prospect. Uh, probably a third rounder is about where he was slotted according to the talent. He is coming back to Vanderbilt. Of course, the Diamondbacks drafted him and signed Jordan Lawler. Uh, for around $6 million uh, in the first round, that's where they picked him. So the, the Diamondbacks sort of hedged their bets and said, all right, we'll take two Vandy shortstops who are committed to that school, and if we don't sign one, we'll take the other. Well, they got the top one in Jordan Lawler. So Davis Diaz is coming back to Vanderbilt, which has been expected for a while. Another Commodore, Carter Holton, a two-way player who was taken by the Brewers late. He is coming to Vanderbilt. And then you've got Ty Evans, the outfielder picked in round 20. He is coming to Florida rather than go pro. You've got Luke Holman of Alabama, who was taken in round 20. Holman was a, a consensus top 250 prospect or really close to it. Evans was about that same range. So coups for both those teams. Uh, in terms of Holton, Holton was rated, I think, top 150, 200 by most services, almost inside some top 100s. So big get for Vanderbilt there. So those five guys, Davis Diaz and Carter Holton of Vanderbilt, Drake Varnado of Arkansas, I don't think I mentioned him. He is also coming to school, uh, and he was considered, let me find this one now. I've got a huge list of stuff in front of me. <laughs> so sometimes it takes me a moment to sort through all this. Um. Varnado was taken 498 overall. He was also consensus top 200 prospects. So a lot of shortstop talent making its way into the SEC that was drafted and could have gone pro. Yep, uh, that's, uh, that's again, a nice thing to have. If you're some of these teams, and like you said, I mean, you think about programs like Arkansas, of course, Vanderbilt, and what we've seen from them, uh, certainly, you know, not just this past season, but uh, trajectory and those types of things and so yeah any any talent you can get and, and have them come back and um yeah i just you know I, i'm i'm looking kind of having rosters pulled up and just looking at all right some of these guys are coming back now you already look at it based on what you were already sort of projecting you know rosters to look like next season and yeah like it's just you know you beat the same drum at this point like the sec is gonna have a lot of really really good teams and and with some of these guys Back in the fold, uh, it only makes some of these teams stronger that probably would have already, you know, slotted in as, as top five, top 10, top 25 uh, type teams uh, anyway. So, OK, in terms of arms, we have not talked about the biggest one who got through the draft, who was drafted. That's Chase Burns, uh, the Tennessee commit from local Beach High School. That's in the Nashville area. He was drafted around 20 by the Padres. He's coming to Tennessee. That's huge. That's a guy that was a potential first rounder before the season. He got second ground, second round grades most places I looked. So huge get for the Vols there in, in terms of Chase Burns. Guys who did not get drafted, who the league got through the draft, uh, Peyton Stovall, the second baseman, who was an Arkansas commit, he was a potential first rounder. He didn't get drafted at all. So, of course, he is coming to Arkansas. Jonathan Cannon, the Georgia right-hander already on the team, he was a potential top half of the first rounder coming into the year, had a disappointing year. He announced during the draft he was returning. Florida gets a couple of borderline top 100 guys in Pierce Coppola and Michael Roberson through the draft. Uh, Vanderbilt, one of the stunners, too. Isaiah Thomas, the Commodore outfielder who was an All-SEC guy, I believe second team All-SEC. He does not get drafted at all after being 
pretty much a consensus second rounder before the season. He's back. Uh, a lot of other commitments. Uh, Florida really cleaned up here. Uh, Brandon Neal, right-hander, is coming to school. Philip Abner, left-hander, who was ranked almost in the stratosphere of the other two Florida guys I talked about. So the Gators probably made out as well as anybody. Arkansas, another team that did pretty well. In addition to Stovall, Hagen Smith, the left-hander, is coming to school. Uh, gave the RC, the outfielder, who some places like Perfect Game being one of those. Uh, he's coming to school. And Florida also gets catcher Renee Lastris through school, too. He was a top 250 prospect by a lot of people. So I would say a lot of teams did well, but the Gators, my goodness, Blake, <laughs> between the kids they got through the draft and Fabian coming back, that's a team that I think, in spite of the difficulties this year, I think you have to slot Florida in probably as a preseason top five team after Fabian's coming back. Now, the issue is going to be established pitching, but uh, Florida did pretty well for itself, and I think as well as Kevin O'Sullivan could have hoped coming into this. Yeah, if the uh, the Florida Gators are going to have a revenge tour in uh, 2022, it feels like that, like you said, all the all the dots seemingly connected for the most part, uh, for them to be able to do that, given, again, already projecting ahead and thinking that they were going to be a team that certainly you're probably going to slot in the top 10 uh, regardless. But now to get all those guys through and to get Judd Fabian back, like you said, uh, yeah, I think it's pretty clear that Florida's going to be a preseason top five team. And you would hope that uh, this time around, uh, like many other times, that they have uh, managed to be a top preseason team and then actually wind up being one of the best teams in the country. Um, you would think that this time, hopefully, they'll, they'll have a little bit of that chip on their shoulder, like I said, uh, to maybe uh, lean off of uh, what they did uh, this past season. Well, and here's some other guys. None of these guys were drafted, but all these are players who could have been drafted who are coming back. And, and again, if you follow SEC baseball, these are names you know. Vanderbilt will get closer Nick Maldonado back. Uh, Cameron James, I would presume, would return to Mississippi State. They're starting third baseman who really came on late. Luke Hancock, state catcher, did not get drafted. Jalen Battles, Arkansas shortstop, and a terrific one. He'll be back. Parker Stinnett from Mississippi State, one of their key bullpen arms that we saw in Omaha. Uh, Florida gets Chris Armstrong, who is a first baseman. I think he played some right. Uh, his DH some just hits the tar out of the ball. He didn't get picked. Uh, some other players, Jerry Ely, although he's really a football player, um, more than a baseball player, but he's he's a guy on that campus who could have easily gotten drafted, did not. Uh, then you go Jonathan Childress at A&M. Um, he's coming back. You, you got Cody Greenhill at Auburn, although I think Greenhill's eligibility might be up. Uh, Ethan Smith at Vanderbilt. C.J. Smith at Georgia didn't get picked either. Uh, and I don't know with Smith and some of these kids, they've been there a while. Uh, you know, with the COVID, sometimes you get the extra year. I don't know what the status is of a few of these guys is in terms of ability to return. Uh, but those are just some other names of kids that didn't get picked at all in the draft that you could see back on campus, Blake. Yeah, it should be interesting uh, with a lot of those. And I'm going to tell you, like, I'm still sitting here while while we're doing this. And, of course, it's always interesting, right, to look at some of the reactions uh, on Twitter and such. And <laughs> I just, like, have a, a stream up for the Kumar Rocker, like just a Twitter search on Kumar Rocker. And to see some of the things um, just c coming down, I, I've got to give you one of the funny ones here. Um, so there's one from uh, someone who says, and I assume this is a Mets fan, who said that, well, you know, now Kumar Rocker will sign with the Braves, uh, go 356-0 and in his career with an ERA of 0 0.89, and he will throw 67 perfect games in his MLB career. So the Mets are cursed. So that's that's the thought from Mets fans right now based on uh, what their expectations are for Kumar Rocker in the uh, major leagues once he signs with the team. Like this is what I don't get, okay? Every pitcher, you're either having some kind of arm issues or you're going to have them at some point, right? Right, yes. Okay, from, from what I know, again, I have yet to hear of anything unless it is super private, super private, that is, that is incredibly concerning about his health. So what is an average, what is a good third starter in baseball make these days? 10, 15 million dollars, probably, probably closer to 15. I mean, some might make, what did Charlie Morton sign with for the Braves? Although I guess he's more than a, than a three right now, but um, I think that's what he was at the time. I mean, point being, okay, Kumar Rocker is not going to make a ton of money by baseball standards until he goes through that first contract 
and gets into that second one, which is where you make your money in the big leagues. You know, $6 million for a guy that talented. Now, I get they get an 11th pick overall next year that you can use for something, but the chances of using that pick on somebody who's got as much upside as Kumar Rocker, that's pretty slim. So I'm just wondering, with all the money that players get paid these days and the fact that I think Rocker, if he's okay, you could see him pitching in the bigs a couple years from now. What did the Mets gain by this, by by trying to get him signed to sign for $4 million instead of $6 million or whatever? I mean, the risk versus the reward for what players cost these days, this just, to me, seems like a stupid move unless there's something we just don't know. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't get it either because, like you said, well, now all you do is you go into the next year's draft again, whether they're picking it at eleven or whatever it is. Like, what's the? I don't know. Like again, you you just it's it's very mind boggling. I think just the way it played out. Um, just knowing that it's a it's a possibility that this was even you know again a possibility. Like it's just I don't think we ever really consider this. Of course, you always think about it when it comes to you know deadlines and, and trying to get contracts in place and all this, but I just don't think like this is one that we really thought was going to happen. And I, I think it's, unless it is something, as you said, that's just completely, um, we have no idea about and probably won't have any idea about. This just doesn't really make a lot of sense, uh, probably based from a, a, a Met standpoint uh, for certain. Well, I guess if you're going to go pro, you can go to Japan for two or three years and then come back as an international free agent, at which point there's no cap on what you can get, right? Yeah, right. So maybe that's what makes the most sense. I don't know. But again, you are you're half a world away from everybody that loves you at a young age. I mean, usually Japan is where you go if you're either from there or if your career is on the rocks here. So I, again, I'm not to say what makes sense for Kumar Rocker, but... um it, it just still stuns me that given all that was at stake and the cost that they were going to have to pay him for the talent he has, that everybody went through and did this the way they did. Yeah, it, but if you if you said that same sentence to a Mets fan, they'd probably say, well, that's the Mets. Um, like it or not, like that's, I think, what they've established over the years, unfortunately, um, is at times that they have they have not made the most, I guess, sensical um, decisions in some of these cases. And this just feels like one that you wonder, you know, it just, uh, I don't know. I don't know how it comes back on them. And, and again, what we're looking at next season, I don't, I don't even know that, you know, again, we're not really going to know, right, until they make their pick next year, like what the, the ultimate uh, outcome, is, I guess, from this, from their standpoint. Of course, obviously, we have to also think about that from Rocker's standpoint. But yeah, it's, um, I'm not sure. Well, here's another Mets SEC footnote. Uh, the Mets last year picked Pete Crow Armstrong middle of the first round, who was a Vanderbilt commitment. They traded him this weekend to what, the Cubs? So, yeah, they got a lot got a lot of that one too, huh? So uh, Yeah, I mean, what what, are, <laughs> what is that team doing in terms of developing talent? I mean, it's probably where, good. Where are the players going to come? I mean, may, maybe they're playing for the number one pick in, in 2028, for all I know at this point, but... <laughs> um it just listen it's a good it, thing we cover the sec and i think there's a lot of people in our territory who are braves fans and so they're they're eating this up i think so yeah well blake any parting thoughts before we end the show today no i mean that's the big one as we said i think that's you know that's not the one that we're just talking about it's what everybody's talking about uh when you have again a guy pick that high and not signing. And, uh, now I really think it's just all about what's next. Um, once we figure out what's next for Kumar Rocker, that probably answers a lot of questions on Vanderbilt fan minds. Um, also I think just for casual baseball fans in general to see uh, where he goes from here. So yeah, it's, um, yeah, just, I didn't expect us to be talking about this, uh, in that particular scenario. All right. Thank you for listening to this episode of the 14. Be sure and follow us at 14 southeastern.com. Visit our website at southeastern14.com. Get the podcast, rate, review, and subscribe wherever you get your podcast. I'm Chris Lee. He's Blake Lovell. Thank you for listening to this edition of The 14.